So my purpose here today is to just to talk a little bit about what the things are that you should know. Now, I'm not going to give you the full icing regime, and I'll just tell you why, because some of the photographs you're going to see up here, I was the pilot in the airplane uh, as part of that research project that we did on icing. Uh, we, were, we were tagged by the FAA to do it because uh, some years ago, the particular airplane we're talking about here, the Mitsubishi Mu-2, was... Uh, <clears throat> It was focused on by saying there were many, many icing accidents with aircraft. And we found out over a period of time that literally was not true. Uh, it was pilot, it was lack of knowledge of, of icing conditions. And you know, that's the kind of problem that we have in training people is that what do you train them? You, know, how, you can't train them with everything, but you need to prepare them for certain things. And uh, preparing you for a little bit of uh, knowledge on icing is really important. So I put together a few slides here today to kind of help you with that. Uh, my background is I'm a DPE. Um, I was a test pilot for Mitsubishi for 20 years. Uh, I flew the MU-2, the turbo prop, which uh, Patrick and I now own one here. Uh, we flew that airplane uh, in all types of icing conditions. We went looking for ice. A lot of it was natural icing conditions, a lot of it behind the Air Force tanker. So we and were the only airplane, by the way, the MU-2 was the only airplane to fly in our category and class, and that includes light jets behind the tanker and didn't fail. The only airplane that failed or that didn't fail SLD testing behind the tanker. Citation didn't make it, Kinger didn't make it, none of them could make it. The only one that ever passed it was the MU2. So kind of interesting, right? An airplane that has such a bad reputation. Yeah. So anyway, what what's really important about icing? There's kind of, there are two different types of icing, aren't there? Um, what's what what are the two types of icing? Not not talking about types of icing you see on an airplane. But we have two types of icing that we might be concerned about. One of them is right here on the slide in front of you. What's that? Icing that forms on an airplane while it's sitting on the ground. So I don't have a lot of slides related to that, so let's talk about that slide in particular. What's he got to do before he leaves? Right, he's got to go through de-icing, right? He's going to go out there to a de-icing pad, and they're going to spray him down with the icing fluid. Why would they do that? Why don't they want ice on the wings of an airplane? It just rubs the flow of air. Yeah, it disturbs the flow of air over the top of the wing. It's not going to hurt anything else. Ice will also add a little weight, and especially when you have ice falling on top of, a, of an aircraft. You've heard of airplanes that have, that have crashed in black ice, what they call black ice. The black ice is really ice is formed after the aircraft is on the ground. You have fuel that's so cold and you have outside atmospheric conditions that cause that to condense. Um, on top of the wing, and then it freezes, refreezes, they call it black ice. It can be on the top of the wing, it can be on the bottom of the wing. So we need to remove that. So you've all heard, uh, maybe long ago, well, you guys are all too young for this, but back years ago, they had a policy that they said, if you have ice on the wing of an airplane, polish it. What does that mean? Well, take your glove and polish it so that it's smooth. Well, they started losing airplanes doing that as well. So you don't want to have that situation. You don't want that to exist. Anytime you see ice anywhere on the tops of the wings or tops of the tail, it's time to get it off there. How would you get the ice off? On the solution. You could put some glycol solution on it, right? Knock it off that way. That's the that's the easiest way to do it. I, I did. I had a twin commands you one time. I was up in northern Michigan. and I had to get ice off the wings and it sat overnight, and I didn't know what to do. So I went down to the local automotive store and I bought a bunch of. Uh, of a windshield the ice fluid and then poured it all over the airplane. Turned the airplane blue. <laughs> we had a hard time getting it off. <laughs> so that's one thing you do need to be careful of. Could you put it in a hanger? Yep. Sure. But what would you want to do before you pull it back out of the hanger? Make sure it's dry. Dry it off, right. Why? You pull it out of the hanger, all those droplets, uh, the droplets on top of the wing, what are they gonna do? They're gonna freeze again. And you have the same problem all over, right? So if you see ice on a fuselage, on the wings, on any parts of the aircraft, you need to get it off there somehow. I've, we've been creative and gotten it off any number of different ways. Uh, uh, you know, pouring something on it is, a, you can even pour warm water on it, but be, beware, that water's going to refreeze at some point. All right. That's all I really need to know about that. Here's the other type of icing right here. This is icing on components of the airplane that you might accumulate in flight. Now, what you're looking at here is yellow ice. That's a don't eat yellow snow, right? So this is yellow ice, but where it came from, it came from the Air Force tanker. The purpose of it was to see what parts of the airplane would ice up, how they would ice up, and this was what we called SLD testing. You know what SLD is? Super cool liquid droplets, right? What is that? 
Super cool. It's somebody just discovered this years ago. Well, they didn't really discover it. They said they discovered it, but they didn't. It's like the guy that discovered the internet, right? What was his name? The, the politician discovered oh, it. Al Gore. Yeah, Al Gore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this particular FA guy was uh, very opposed to the MU2. He was one of the guys that came into the uh, the actions against the airplane. <clears throat> and he said, Ice pulls this airplane out of the air, which is which it does not. But he said that he discovered SLD, super cool liquid droplets. Those are droplets that are larger and cooler and higher density of air. And it's measured through a machine that you put on top of the aircraft when you fly. And it tells you what those droplets are like. And it tells you whether you're in SLD conditions or not. So everything we sprayed out of the tank or on the airplane was done using that methodology. So and I have a couple pictures of that that I'll show you here as we go along. But icing on the leading edges, and you can see this icing underneath the wings. Any exposed surface on an airplane will gather ice. Some you have the ability to shed, some you do not. But this is what you get when you get an SLD. And we were right behind the Air Force tanker. That uh, nozzle head uh, on the aircraft spraying was about from here to that clock. And you're flying formation on that aircraft and you're moving over and putting a certain part of the wing on. Then you move it over and put a little bit more of the wing on and you move it over and put the nose on it. We've got some really startling pictures. I don't have them all here. But if you're ever interested, I'll, let, I'll run the icing video for you. It's about an hour long. So here's one, some of the things you do need to know. When you see ice on an aircraft, you need to kind of try to identify it. Now, they say at ATC, they don't care. What they do care about is accumulation rates. We'll talk about that in a minute. But here are the types of rime, or the, uh, the icing you get. Well, no, the first one is rime ice. It's kind of opaque. And so we, used to, we call it Hershey bar ice because it looks like a Hershey bar on the leading edge of the wing. You'll see that. It, it doesn't have to be completely smooth. It can be a little bit opaque and it can be a little bit rough, but it forms basically right on the leading edge of the wing. The next one is clear ice. That's transparent and smooth and has, you can get rough horns. You know, they'll actually build out from the leading edge of the wing. And if you've ever seen some of those pictures, it's pretty startling. You wonder why the airplane's still flying. But uh, they do fly, and we've flown our airplane in those kinds of conditions as well. But that's kind of a, a really kind of weird ice. It hits, and then it runs, and as it runs, it freezes. And it'll, re it'll freeze in a reverse horn coming off of the leading edge of the wing. Then you have mixed ice, which is a mixture of the two types of ice. And most of the time we see icing out here in the system, we'll see mixed ice. It's not always just simply clear rime or clear ice or, or rime ice. Then you have the bad stuff, the SLD, that's run back ice. So it's, it's, it's at a temperature that's been, let's look at a thunderstorm. What happens with moisture in a thunderstorm? It's sucked up, right? So moisture in a thunderstorm gets sucked up and when it does, it's at a warm temperature and it's sucked up into minus 10 degree centigrade uh, uh, temperatures, you come along and smack through it. And when you do, it, it hits the airplane in a liquid form. When it does that, it runs back. When it runs back, guess what? It freezes. All right, so you get run back ice. So it hits on the leading edge, runs back, and freezes. That's what you saw in that previous picture, was ice or water that had run back on the leading edges, uh, from the leading edges underneath, and had formed in, uh, had it formed in ice there and that by the way that those pictures were taken in flight and the airplane was very little affected by even that much ice on board okay those are the types of icing so for test questions purposes i'll just i'll kind of you know maybe try to stop my feet a little bit on test questions so um i might say you know what what is rhyme ice okay it's opaque smooth uh hershey bar ice if you say hershey bar ice it's just not a leading edge of the way that's a good answer right if I say what's SLD, that's run back ice, very dangerous, very dangerous. Stay out of it. If you get in it, get out of it. Okay, the next one are the types of icing again, but now we're going to talk about accumulation rates. So this is kind of interesting because do you, anybody know anything about an airplane that's certified in the known icing conditions? Have you ever heard that term before? Certified in the known ice. What does that mean? It means that you can fly in known icing conditions up to moderate. But there's some interesting things about moderate ice that you need to know. It's designed to allow you to go through it and get out of it, as opposed to flying it all day. And that's a very important fact and a very important part of it, because once you get ice on an airplane, if you don't have the icing equipment on the airplane, how are you going to get it off? You're not. All right. So you have trace ice. And when you report trace ice, what you're talking about is a, a discoloration of the leading edge. <laughs> And the discoloration of the leading edge means that you're getting some ice on there. And it could be any number of things. It could be impact snow, and it could be actually really ice. But you'd get that going through some freezing mist uh, conditions. The next one is light. 
it neither sublimates or accumulates in this case. So a little icing on the airplane and it's not coming off. And it's not gonna come off until somebody takes it off there. Continued flight not, not recommended. Well, look at that, that's the slight icing. Airplane certified into known icing conditions, including airliners, by the way, get into ice, light ice. Continued flight not re recommended, why? Because any amount of ice that accumulates on an airplane will continue to accumulate until it reaches moderate, severe, and so forth. Most of these are the rate of accumulation. So light means that you're getting it and it's sublimating. You're getting it and sublimating. It's staying at about the same level, but you really don't want to stay in it for very long. Moderate, on the other hand, accumulates slow to moderate and the equipment can handle it. And that's where you get this known icing certification. What are you going to have with known icing certification? You're going to have windshield heat. You're going to have leading edge, either heat, uh, boots, um, TKS, a number of ways that you get ice off of the airplane in certain areas. So it means that your equipment on the airplane can actually handle it. And it'll keep taking the ice off of the airplane. So moderate is where that big ugly line is drawn. You, up to moderate ice, you can fly through it if you're in an airplane that's certified for normalizing conditions. You can fly through it and, and uh, uh, basically come out the other side unscathed. Severe accumulation is faster than the icing equipment can shed. If you see severe icing, you need to be getting out like now, like right this minute. You need to be getting out of it. And there's one beyond it, which is super cool, and it says immediate diversion required. And that's where they were testing us behind the tanker. Could we get that kind of icing and could we divert? And the answer was yes. Other aircraft, not so much. So if you see any of these types of ice, you should recognize it by its accumulation rate. There's nothing really important about that from a test question standpoint, is except for what? What do I do if I get into icing conditions? So this is what we talked about a minute ago, flight and known icing conditions. Only aircraft equipped with the ice and anti-ice equipment, and it has to be certified by the manufacturer, which is done with flight testing. So you get you you guys upgrade to a Baron, and the Baron's got boots on it, right? It's got boots. Oh, look at this. I got boots, I got I got hot propellers on this airplane. Man, I can fly in icing conditions. No, sorry. If it doesn't say certified for known icing conditions in the flight manual, the airplane's not certified. It means it hasn't been tested. It means it's lacking some piece of equipment. In this particular case, what it might be would be windshield heat. Now, windshield heat can be done with a, you know, a plate that they stick on the front of the window. You look through that in icing conditions. It can be done with alcohol. Uh, the alcohol that comes from an alcohol tank that sprays up in the window. Uh, airplanes can be certified in icing conditions, but they have to be tested before they can do that. So all aircraft must be uh, functional at the time of flight, so you can't have a, you can't have something that's inoperative. If you if you've never been in icing conditions with a three bladed propeller and lost the one of the boots on one of the propeller blades, you have not lived until the the ice sheds from that one blade. Just that far from the hub, it will set up a vibration that will knock your socks off. Okay, so it's it's something that's very important in terms of the kinds of equipment that are on, on the airplane. So it says. The definition is this, you're allowed to file into and through known a fork or forecast icing conditions. You'll find that in the regulations on known icing. So that's not really a test question, it's more for information than, than anything else. And that is that if your airplane does not have all of the pieces of equipment on it and certified by the manufacturer to fly known icing conditions, then it may not do so. What does that mean? You know you get a little ice in the clouds and they say today, uh, you're going to go out and do IFR training with somebody, you know, 172. And they go, uh, we have a, a pie rep for a light icing uh, in the layer of clouds that's 2,000 feet thick. And you're planning on going to fly. Can you go fly? No, under no circumstances. Because you may have filed through known icing conditions. And as soon as you get a pie rep in an area you're going to fly in, that's a known icing condition. If it's forecast to be in your area, it's a known icing condition. So you can't fly in. Okay. Okay. Um, well, I just brought, put all these things on here. Wing boots, TKS or bleed air, alcohol, propeller, uh, alcohol or hot props, pedal and stall vane heat. You can have that on the airplanes you fly. You don't have stall vane heat, but you have pedal heat, right? So you have the icing equipment on a Cessna 172 or probably any other airplane that you're flying out here. So you do have that one piece with the icing equipment. Why do we need that? Well, if you should get into ice, one thing we don't want you to do is lose your instrumentation. And you won't lose your instrumentation as long as your pedal heat is on and functioning. So on your pre-flight, you go going out to fly instruments, Make sure you're teaching your guys to turn that pedo heat on, go out there and do this until they know it's warming up. All right, don't do this. 
because you may be there for a while. It's <laughs> like the kid with, you know, like a, a Christmas story. <laughs> you know, the flagpole, just talking about the flagpole, right? Yeah. <clears throat> Oil cooler inlets, uh, some airplanes have them, some applications have them. Heated uh, pilot window, heated window or plate uh, or alcohol. Engine inlets, so if you're turbine engine, you gotta have engine inlets. And there's some really ugly stories about airplanes with inoperative turbine or engine inlets where ice will accumulate on that, then it will go into the turbine. And turbine engines are designed with their duct work just exactly so, so that the efficiency going into the first stage compressor is there. As soon as you disturb that, that engine's not gonna run. And an example of that is a flight that I took um, uh, several years ago now, we were doing testing in uh, Idaho in natural icing conditions. We were picking up ice and we had an airliner screaming bloody murder out there. He says, I'm picking up all kinds of ice. It was a commuter. Picking up all kinds of ice, get me out of here. So they finally got him out of the ice and we said to ATC, where was that guy? And they said, 20 miles to your left, uh, turn right to avoid. We said, negative, turn us toward it. So we went over there and, and got all that icing as well. And we were, we had loaded up with icing and we were coming back and ATC said, descend and maintain. Well, we had a little tiny inside, I have pictures of it, I don't have here, but a little tiny pencil thin piece of ice that was inside the engine intake area. And as we descended a thousand feet into warmer air, it came off. We lost both engines. <laughs> in IFR conditions, in icing, at, at, at dusk. And so I called the ATC and said, we've lost both engines, uh, turn us toward the, uh, toward the airport. He said, well, all right, turn right and maintain one six thousand feet. I said, negative, you don't understand. We're a two-engine airplane. We've lost them both. We're a glider, turn us toward the airport. As soon as I made that call and made the turn, I went to an emergency double engine restart. They both restarted. We'd only lost 1,500 feet of, uh, of uh, altitude in doing all that. But when we landed on the ground, we had ice all over the airplane. We had a dinner plate size piece of ice on the nose of the airplane that was concave, look a right, like a radar dish, and it was that thick. And we took all the ice off the airplane and put it in a bucket and weighed it, five pounds. <laughs> that was it. A lot of ice, but five pounds. So maybe somebody says, what's, what's most dangerous about ice on an airplane? Well, it weighs so much. No, forget that. It doesn't work. Doesn't doesn't weigh a lot of them. Even if you get run back ice, it's just not that heavy. So it's not going to be the detriment. Go ahead. So what causes the engines to fail? Disturbance of, and we're talking about a turbine engine now. That's the service of the airflow. They're very, very highly efficient. The turbines of these things are turning like 44,000 RPM. And that the flow of the air into that intake is being compressed down into an area about that big, and it's blowing through there, and then it goes through a second stage turbine, then it goes through the, the power turbines back there, a compressor, then power turbines in the back, and out the back as jet thrust, and, a, uh, and then power to a propeller. So a jet engine kind of works the same way. But if you disturb that airflow going into that area, that engine will quit because you're disturbing the, 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 the dynamics and the flow and the smoothness of the air that's going into that first stage of pellet. So was it the ice that like got melted and became water and went into the engine? Or? No, it was the ice hitting the blades oh. and going back and hitting the blades and disturbing the flow and the efficiency of that blade. Oh. Okay, that disturbed the air downstream of that, that got to the back, the, the, air, the air fuel mixture changed and it went dark. Just so, like that. so then did that airplane have uh, any damage? No. No? None whatsoever. Both engines restarted. It was an airplane that I owned. Uh, the airplane was restarted and we flew it back and landed. We had a scientist on board. He was at his console, big console back there. And he had all the stuff because we had all the, the rig on the airplane, everything rigged to, to data record icing. And we, we landed and he came over to us. He said, that was kind of cool. And I said, what do you mean it was cool? He said, yeah, you guys shut both engines down so you could look at the ice on the propeller spin. <laughs> yeah, well, definitely what we did. That's a scientist for it, <laughs> right. Another part of the story is we called him Fart and Larry because uh, his console was up front in the airplane. There's an outflow valve in the front and an outflow valve in the back, but he was in the front outflow valve area, so he'd sit back there in his seat, passing gas, and we'd all get in the cockpit. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, what are icing conditions? Anytime the outside indicated air temperature is less than 10 C, plus 10 C. Now, right, zero, zero C is what, 32 degrees, right? So you think, hey, wait a minute. If it's plus 10 C, then we're really not in, in icing conditions, which you really are. 
So at plus 10 C, that, that um, compression on the leading edge of the wing can cause a drop in temperature. And when it causes a drop in temperature, it causes a little, it'll cause the temperature to heat up first because of impact force and friction, and then it'll start to freeze immediately. So that's what you get. Anytime you're in plus 10 degrees C or below, you're in potential icing condition, but you have to couple that with being in visible moisture. Now there are there are cases where that they weren't visible moisture. Uh, beach jets, you may have heard several years ago, several beach jets lost their engine at 41, 43,000 feet, and they were in the vicinity of the thunderstorms. But they weren't in thunderstorms, and they weren't in icing conditions, and they were beautiful VFR. But there was moisture in the air, and that moisture was building up on the cone inside that jet engine. Did the same thing we talked about. It started to disturb the airflow. The engine flamed out. Now in one case, in one case, it did damage an engine. And it was because he tried to restart it at 35,000 feet, which is not within the startup rule. You got to be below 20. Okay, this is a question I ask on every one of these uh, exams, and that is if you got icing, what's more dangerous, wing and tail icing or propeller icing? Anybody know the answer to that question? See, nobody's taking the test with me. Uh, what do you think? Wing and tail. Wing and tail? That's the answer I get from literally everyone. They think wing and tail icing is the most important. It is not. And the reason is because, well, let's talk about that first. What's a propeller? It's an airfoil. It's an airfoil, correct? It's just like your wing, except how fast is it going? It's more like 400 RPM. Yeah, it's going 2400 RPM, right? Well, that equates to speeds at the tips, probably close to the speed of sound. The inside, closer to the propeller hub, it's a lot slower, but it's a lot faster than the wing going through the air, isn't it? But it's an airfoil. When we talk about icing conditions, where can ice build on an airplane? Any exposed surface. Does that include the propeller? Sure. What do you need from that propeller when you're flying? Thrust. If you disturb the thrust and you get a formation of ice on the prop, you disturb the thrust, you lose your propeller thrust. If you lose propeller thrust, where are you going? No. Now, <clears throat> you have no choice. Now, if you're flying a if you're flying a, um, uh, a constant speed propeller airplane, variable speed pitch, you can take the prop. If you get a little ice on the propeller, you can take that prop and go. And it changes the pitch of the prop. When it changes the pitch of the prop, it will knock some of that ice off. Almost always. Now, propellers, what what's, gets the most roughage, we'll call it that, when you're flying an airplane? When you go out and pre-flight your airplane, you run your hand along the leading edge of the propeller, what do you have to be careful of? You don't cut yourself, right? Why? Because propellers pick up debris. And when they pick up debris, they're made out of aluminum, in most cases. And that debris, little sand pieces and particles of dirt, what have you, actually make little pock marks. You've seen on the leading edge of any propeller blade, you go out here and look and see the, the paint's worn off, right? Why is the paint worn off? Debris. Debris, sand, water, anything will take that and roughen the leading edge of the propeller. So if you've got a rough propeller, you've got an ice catcher. Everything that touches that prop's gonna stick to it. So the propeller is far more dangerous and it will accumulate ice at a faster rate. If you want to know all about that, go into AC, uh, what is this, 9174, 6174, the icing, uh, icing AC. Go in there and look at propeller icing. And when you see that, you're gonna see pictures they took in the wind tunnel of ice that can form on the blades on these propellers. And you'll also see one on an airplane that got ice from the tip all the way outboard from the, the, the ice boots, and the de-ice boots were overwhelmed because it was absolutely SLD conditions, that was my airplane. We basically wrote the propeller icing section for that AC, for the FAA. And all the testing we did was for the FAA anyway. So propeller icing is more dangerous. Wing icing can be dangerous if it reaches a shape, especially on a, on a low performance airplane, if it reaches a shape where, it's, uh, where it really disturbs the airflow. But will the airplane quit flying? Probably not. Will you need to maintain a higher approach speed? Absolutely, right? Because you've got some disturbed air coming over the, the uh, leading edge and coming over the top of the wing. So the most important thing there is maintain your speed, don't get too slow. Your stall speeds will increase if you get ice on the leading edge of the wing. Will the airplane fall out of the air? No, likely not. Propeller, 
I just had a propeller at a faster rate. You lose thrust, you're coming down anyway. Okay. Now here was my slide. So what do you do when you see X? Make a 180 degree turn? Is that a good one? Could be, maybe. Depends, right? What if you're in buildups? You're flying in your little airplane, you're flying in through buildups, and you penetrate one. You get a little ice. What do you do? Turn in the direction where your nuclear air was, right? Turn around, get out of it. But if you're on a solid layer of clouds and you start getting ice like that, a 180 degree turn may or may not change the profile. What about the next one? Climb. Can you climb? Maybe if you have power. 180 horsepower engine, you got the power to climb if you get into ice. Maybe not. Okay. Descend? Yes. That's probably your best answer because icing of most types only exists in a two or 3,000 foot layer. When you descend, you're going to get into warmer air. Ice will fall off. But if you try to climb to get on top, you could be in an area where you're going to get SLD. Now, I don't have any slides out in here on that, but we have an area we call an area of coalescence. And that area of coalescence is right at the tops of a layer of stratus clouds. So you're flying up through the clouds and you're picking up a little ice and you get right to the top of the clouds and you pick up more ice. And why is that? The sun's beating down on the clouds. The wind is causing a turbulence flow in the moisture that's in the top of that cloud. So you have moisture droplets banging against one another and form, forming larger droplets. So what do we have? SLD. And you're in the top of the cloud, so it's kind of liquid moisture because the sun is heating it. The next thing you know, you got an airplane full of ice. So don't try to climb on top if you couldn't go down. Now, all things taken into consideration, if you're mountains, you want to go down, but you don't want to go down until you know where you're going down, right? The last one, panic. Yeah. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, you read a, an accident report, and the accident report will say um, icing was partially the cause of the accident. And that may or may not be true because of that. The pilot may panic, and if the pilot panics, what happens is they start making bad decisions about icing. Why? They have no knowledge of icing. Nobody's ever done what we're doing here today is to teach you a little bit of ice information so that you don't so that you don't panic when you get into icing conditions. Now, I flew, I gave my instruction in Michigan out of Pontiac Airport. We wanted to fly instrument flight, we flew on ice with a 172. I had as much as two inches of ice on the leading as a 172 and still flown it. So my experience back in those days was a, a function of where I was in the country. I was in Michigan. If we waited for every single day to be clear to do any training, the school would have gone out of business. So we tried to stay clear of the ice, but occasionally we got into ice. And when you did, you made decisions about where you needed to be. Was it lower, was it higher? If you could get out of the visible moisture, get below the clouds, you might have ice on the airplane, but it might stop accumulating. And that's kind of the point there. Okay, here we are behind the Air Force tanker. Um, you can see how far we are behind that, uh, that nozzle head, and this is full of water, and they're they're spraying it out of here, and it's hitting different parts of our, well, that's an airplane that I owned, while we had the t this test flight work going on. Um, there's a shot from the cockpit, looking straight up into the nozzle, and there's what the nozzle on the back of that tanker looks like, and they can actually control how much liquid, what the size of the droplets are. So if they want to make SLD, they can make SLD. If they want to make light icing, they can make light icing. But this tanker was set up to spray water for SLD. And we were doing this over the mountains out west. We had a test pile on the left hand seat from the Air Force. And right on our wing, and you couldn't see it in that previous picture, but right there in flying formation with us was an Air Force Lear 35. And the 35 was taking video of the entire action that we were doing during the, during the test flights. You saw this picture before. I pulled this up front so you can see it. This is what happens when you fly in large droplet stuff. There's, you'll see it on a spinner, but you can't see it on a spinner in a single engine airplane, but you can in a twin. Right? It'll form on cowling pieces. It'll form here on the leading edge. That's, that's about an inch and a half to two inches of ragged ice, and it goes all the way back, forming underneath the wing. Now, did we lose airspeed? No. We didn't lose any airspeed. 
Did we lose some wing efficiency? We absolutely did. Here's another shot of it. This one was taken actually from the Learjet. He's looking up past the tip tank here, and he's looking at this wing. Look at the size of that stuff building back here underneath that wing. That's drag, isn't it? So you have to have enough power to overcome the drag. Uh, these are more test flights behind the tankers. You can see here we were testing the inner portion of the wing. You can see the wing and the tail are getting ice on it here. Yeah, look at this. There's no ice out here on that horizontal tail. Why? Right behind the engine. We're putting out 74 degree air behind the engine. This goes right back here and hit the tail. And this is where the horn is right here, the balance horn on the, on the elevator. So we don't have any detriment flying in ice with the tail of this airplane. None whatsoever. Mm -hmm. But here it is building on the uh, on pieces of the airplane. You can see up here, this is outboard. Look at this, this is SLD. And you can tell us SLD why. Because there's the boot and they're knocking it off the boot, but it's running back and building on top of the wing. That's the most dangerous part of SLD. When that comes back on top of the wing, now it forms a fence. So when it forms a fence, what's that doing for you? It's like a spoiler, isn't it? All right, so that is beginning to change the shape of the top of the wing. That's the most dangerous thing you can have. Here's the tail from a shot from the tanker, uh, from the Allergen outside. You can see it forming on the tail, inboard of where the boot starts right here. You can see it forming on the tail, and the tail is upside down. You can see that the camber's on the bottom instead of the top. So the tail's on upside down, and the reason it's upside down is because, what? remember back in your CFI stuff, was what the faster you go, what happens for the requirement for tail force? The faster you go, the more tail force you need, right, for dynamic stability? So Mitsubishi said, well, if we build this airplane so that we have to offset that with a trim tab and with the elevator, we'll lose speed because we'll lose efficiency. So we'll just put the tail on upside down and have the cambered air on the bottom and the flat area on the top. And the faster the airplane goes, the more downlift it, it presents and the more stable it is. Through all operations in this airplane, our trim is about maximum minus, minus one degree, maximum three total. So does it lose efficiency then at lower speeds, or is it still no. designed in a way? No, it stays, it stays totally efficient. Oh. Hi, how you doing? Okay. Yeah, come on in. Okay, so we want to do some testing about this. So we decided we're going to load the airplane up. And what we see here is you see this is a like foam that you squirt. So we squirted foam all over the bottom of the wing in these great big marshmallow looking like pot marks. Here's another shot of them right there. We just dirtied this airplane up like you wouldn't believe it to fly it to see what exactly happened to our lifting qualities and our drag qualities and all the rest of those things. And that's the kind of thing you can do testing. And up here on the top, you can see this. We took a, you know what a quarter round is? For you guys that are that are woodworkers, quarter round is a is a is a, a, a V, or in other words, it's a molding for down here. Quarter round might fit on top of a molding down here in your house. And it's a quarter round. So you take a, a round piece and you split it this way, you wind up with a quarter round, right? And we took that quarter round and it made it bigger. And, on there, and then we took it to a saw and we sawed all kinds of saw tooths in it. So we, what we did was we created a natural barrier on top of the wing and went on foot. So it shows you that it, you can have detriment to lifting qualities if you have things on top of it. Here's a better shot of it right here. It's all taped up. Look at that. That's This is what we built on top of the wing out of this quarter round stuff. And here's what it looks like before we chopped it up. So which, glued to the top of the wing. Which part is the leading edge of like the... Leading, leading edge, edge is right here. Okay. And this is just behind the leading edge and the air is coming this way over the lifting surface. There's the leading edge of the boot right there. There's the... Uh, this, here, well, here's a better picture. Up there's a boot. And there's where we put this lifting, the, this surface. Now, when we used to backhaul airplanes in Vietnam with a helicopter, we used to put boards on top of the wing when we were when we were sling loading it back. Why? Because if that wing turned into the wind, it could fly. And the thing that you're towing could fly up over the top of your rotor system and come back down in, which it did a couple of times for people that didn't follow that procedure. But this, even this, did not turn. So this is to, to say to you that if you get a little run back ice, or get a little ice on top of the wing, it's not going to kill you. You need to maintain a little greater air speeds. That's all. You need to maintain lower air speeds? More air speed. Oh, okay. Yeah. Here's what run back ice looks like. Uh, this was on a, uh, uh, what's that little jet they built out in Albuquerque? Uh, the Eclipse. Eclipse. Yeah. This is an Eclipse. This was, these were proprietary pictures that Eclipse gave me for 
for my ice presentations. This is what runback ice looks like. This is not snow that was on the wing. This is SLD runback ice on the wing. That's what you're going to see. And it's it's not it's not detrimental to flight, but too much of it might be. 